Hello Black, episode 156. We black, man. It's Juneteenth. I don't know if it'll, it'll come out probably on Patreon on Juneteenth, you know, for our loyal subscribers. Support what we got going on, no matter <laughs> how long we drop a podcast. But appreciate all the patrons, the patrons, you know what I'm saying? Patrons, I can't say patron no more. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Hello Black Pod. Before we get started, got to give a special shout out to our sponsors at DraftKings. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff for the law. No, I mean that's what you know. You made it as a podcast, or any. It's it's wild, bro. I was watching the. Uh, but to make it as a podcast, you either have to sell alcohol, or sell gambling. Yeah, I was watching. And a, who owns the gambling? We know that. Hmm. I was watching a, a like vlog that I like to watch. Uh, it's like a food type of thing, uh, and. I was very shocked when, in, like, after the opening credits, uh, DraftKings, like, spot came on. I'm like, damn, they got him too? But, I mean, you you can't turn that bag down, you know? like You can. Yeah, I mean, but you can't if, you know, for certain people can't turn the bag down. If that's what motivates you is, uh, you Harami know, Salami. capital. Yeah. If, if capital is what motivates you, you really can't turn it down. But it's... Uh, I, mean, I think when we talk about to go off on a little tangent, but like this is the a little way for people to start to recognize like monopoly capitalism when the smaller independent things start to gain traction and the larger conglomerates swoop in and start to control them to now where you have all these shows that were quote unquote independent, but now they have what the same exact sponsors. What does that tell you? Control by, by one people. entity, <laughs> by one entity, like and you just they're said, controlling your content. And you know, if you do something that goes against the grain, that bag gonna go. You feel me? Now you control completely economically. <laughs> you feel me? And now your content is controlled economically because you don't want to make a decision that goes against that bag. Because now you depend your whole livelihood on an economic source that <laughs> is controlling, and that is no good. And we can see that from like a small level with, or not small level, I guess you can see that in one form of industry like uh, media, or you can see it in another form of industry like pro- like uh, politics to where, you know, different presidential camp- uh, candidates uh, have to push certain political lines to, APAC. to uh, satisfy their financial backers, the capitalists that fund their campaigns, right? Uh yeah, it's, just, it's just sad. So, I mean, I, it's a joke, you know, we playing as, as a joke, but it also is like the actual state of the world to where, you know, people and people will talk about, oh, I'm independent. No, you're not. <laughs> you know? Like we have we have our sponsor. Might, it just happens to be the community, yeah, <laughs> you know, but like yeah. no one's independent. <laughs> no one's independent. You have some sort of backing and you're backing. Most of these uh, people that are being presented to us as like independent uh, small business entrepreneurs actually have large, uh, large uh, capital financiers, behind you know, the scenes. venture capitalists, large uh, conglomerates, large uh, companies that are backing them. They're not independent. So the next time one of these independent people is trying to sell you a dream, we're all backed by somebody. Are you going to be backed by the community or are you going to be backed by corporations? That's just what you got to ask yourself. But with no, no one's independent. That's a a Western uh, materialist farce. Whether you're talking about materialism as philosophy of you know m- the understanding of matter, or if you're talking about individualism as uh, you know our materialism as uh, the obsession with material possession and material gains, it's I mean, just all connected. Corporations have a stranglehold on everything, you know, even for the the independent podcaster, because even us. As the independent podcast is independent from corporations, quote unquote, or backed by community, quote unquote, you feel me? We still have to upload it <laughs> to a corporation. Mm-hmm. Patreon is still a corporation, and they still getting a cut of it. So wherever you go, they finna find a way to get a cut of your money, for the most part. Everywhere you go, <laughs> they taking a cut. And that's what it is when it's, you know, cap- a capitalist system. They always gonna find a way to get their bag, and no matter what you do, whether it's through buying the microphone, mm-hmm. <laughs> whether it's through 
the machinery used to even record the podcast, they're going to find a way to get a cut. Media. Now, depending yeah. on the cut, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Again, there's a there's a levels to it, you know what I'm saying? You got to also think about, uh, you know, what you promote. You know, essentially, we haven't taken no advertisement money. Mm-hmm. But think about what you promote. What are you promoting to the people as a black podcaster? You know what I'm saying? Because everyone's talking about black podcasters. Everyone's talking about, oh, yeah, you know, they're for the people. But you just promoting gambling for the people? Like, is that, you feel me? Like, is that something that's uh, good for the masses of black people, but you, for the black community? You was pushing New Amsterdam for the black community? Like, literally, the DraftKings, they have their whole advertisement that under it is, if you have a gambling problem, but call, it's in call small, 1-800. small, 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 small fine print. <laughs> like, it's in the finest of print that you could possibly think of. Yeah, probably, it's probably some lawsuit that happened that requires them to even have that in Yeah, it. I mean, it's probably some, like, national you know law. So, it's, it's like, yeah. people get addicted. They're just selling you addictions. And I know it might sound, uh, go, we going off on a tangent, but I believe that we will connect this. I mean, it's still political. It's, it's still political, you know. Um, we will connect this, for sure. And I'm, I'm just, not, like, I mean, the whole media industry is, su- is such a nasty game. Okay, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, the corporate corporate sponsorship and people selling, uh, selling the community their own demise, whether you're talking about gambling, whether you're talking about alcohol, um, and then this whole like headline chasing and that's just just one element like the headline chasing like sometimes i'll read even from like the quote-unquote like political uh podcast right like their episode name be like china's dead the u.s dollar is over with like this like this thing that's just like this is just not so real sensationalist and anti you feel me like it's just like, like like that's what you have to keep up with you know russian warships at the border of miami <laughs> No, for real. It is the just, next Cuban missile crisis. Like it's just like it's like how do you all, how do you compete with that? You know, like as as a grassroots, like truly trying to create something that the people can. Uh, you want you want your message to spread. You want it to be important. You want to politi- politically educate as many people as possible. But how bad do you want to do that? And at what point is what you're doing? How you're going about what you're doing contradictory to what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve, and it's just something that we have to think about. And I think a lot of people are going to look back because even I look back at, you know, things that I've said publicly. You know, we talked about like there's like articles I would go back and change things what I said. You know, you talked about chapters and books you've written where you go back and and like some people are going to have to look at this quote unquote political education they put out to the community and like look back like oh I was out of pocket, you know. Especially even on some like the video stuff, you know, like people be making these faces and shit. I'm like, bro, y'all gotta be kidding me. Like, this is like some modern day minstrel fucking it's zip coons. Podcast shit. zip coons. <laughs> this some, this some podcast zip, coons, zip shit. coons in the name of black culture over here, bug eyed like a, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You feel me? It's, but that's what sells. And then the nasty part of it is you look at who's controlling it, who's making the money, who's directing it. You know what I'm saying? Why is that, you know, if we think about algorithms and like, you got to even think about like the currency behind algorithms. You feel me? Mm-hmm. The people who control it, who allow certain things to uh, expand in a certain type of way compared to, you know, maybe a grassroots community type of show that's really talking about, you know, real things in the community. But the fake is always going to be pushed. The things that, uh, you know, allow you to become self-destructive and whether it's the way you think, the way you're acting, you feel me? Uh, enemies in many ways what they do is they create what I would call like uh, ambassadors of self-destruction <laughs> in the name of culture mm-hmm. in these shows alright we'll give you a cosign we'll push you up we'll push you up in the algorithm we'll make sure on the Instagram feeds you pop up we'll make sure on the TikTok feeds you pop up we'll make sure on YouTube that you're popping up and some of these people you know uh, have worked very hard you know to get where they are in some ways in life right and, and but the thing is, you know, when you co-sign with that corporation and you start doing the dirty work of the corporation, now you is uh, trying to, you're essentially mimicking what the corporation wants you to do uh, as a black person. But you're divorcing it from any type of uh, revolutionary consciousness. And instead you're just, you know, mimicking the consciousness of the West. Mimicking the cultural values of America in the name of black culture. In the name of, oh, 
community. Yeah. <laughs> in the name of Juneteenth. <laughs> and I, you know, you'll have some people who uh who don't even take like a revolutionary stance, but they at least take uh like pro black humanists. You know, like or you you'll see people who like claim to be like um uh, I would say like they want to contribute positively to to black people. Like they said they love black people and then they'll do something like tell black people to go gamble knowing like we're not even talking about like um like the like what's the lotto is the lotto every month or something like that. I don't know. Mm. Right? We're not we're not even talking about that. We're talking about like daily. Yeah, we're like talking people about are talking that. about like the, the parlay. You feel me? Like daily bets. Like if you go on DraftKings, I'm sure you can there's like there's sports on every day. Yeah. From you can bet on something every, every single day. day. And we're talking about people who are betting like those those twenty dollar four dollar bets add up every day. You feel me? When we have a situation from from where twenty twenty to twenty twenty three five billion people were made poor, like people don't have that kind of excess uh, capital to throw around. At least that's what it says statistically. Mm-hmm. That people don't have that type of capital to to turn around. So it's like you telling people to take this little forty dollars every day and to 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 bet it. Like if you bet forty dollars, you know every week and you losing each time, is that one hundred and sixty dollars? You feel me? So now you get over two months, you don't lost three hundred and twenty dollars. Like that, 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 that adds and up. Usually, when you bet, you are gonna keep betting. When you in that hole, you looking for a way out that hole. Take yeah. it from a nigga who was a serial gambler. You feel me? Like th- I, I, this is I just like I really understand how gambling works. <laughs> take, you feel take, me? Take it from- and I never use like draft like no betting apps or anything yeah. like that. But just like I understand gambling, just from you shooting dice. You feel me? Like you yeah. you you learn. And so I just think, um, yeah, yo. We made we made a joke about the DraftKings stuff and New Amsterdam and Seagrams and whoever else is sponsoring people, but you know it really is just uh, nasty work. But what we'll talk about today, I think, can get us through that in terms of uh, organizing. And on the subject of Juneteenth, though, I think we should take some time to not. not uh, I I just uh, I really had a great time this past Sunday. For folks that aren't familiar. Uh, Juneteenth festival is something that's been happening in, in Berkeley. I want to say for like thirty-seven years, um, and you know, growing up, it was something that I went to a lot. Uh, and so this was the first one I had went to. I think, let's say, give or take, since like twenty nineteen. I think twenty twenty was when COVID came, right? Yeah. So like twenty nineteen, twenty eighteen was probably the. This was probably the first one I had been to, and. Uh, it it was, it brought back so many memories. I ran into so many like you feel me like childhood friends and classmates and shit. Uh, it was fire. I hadn't seen that many that many black people in uh in Berkeley in a, in a very long time. Uh, and I I want to you know definitely shout out the Juneteenth organizers. You know Miss Dolores uh, Nochi Cooper, uh, the Black Rep Theater Group. I know that they do a, they play a large part. And putting that festival on together, and I, I just think it was dope, you know, for whatever, you know, we have our conversations around, like, you know, what is black culture, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, you know, I think at times, I don't even want to go too often to a tangent, but, yeah, I, I just, for whatever Juneteenth is worth, and we talking about, you know, people cel- celebrating, like, pseudo uh, independence, right? Because, like, what is independence when we just name the stats that we just named in terms of black people selling other black people poison, uh you know, five billion people being made poor from twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty three, and I would love to see how much of that is New Africans. Uh, right, the the, the New African uh, material reality continues to be filled with uh, plight, oppression, and struggle. But um, I think the Juneteenth festival is, for my personal opinion, a microcosm of what's possible when people come together and are bought into one thing, even if the one thing happens to be something that, uh, you know, these like neoliberals and fascists have been able to um, like warp history and co-opt and uh, at times, I guess, uh, put put it in a reactionary place. But I think it's, again, something for, for people who are talking about community and like you saw a lot of red, black, and green out there. You feel me? Like, people are clearly identifying with the flag in some way. So what are college organizations going to do to help elevate that? Because there is some inkling of consciousness in people, um, some identifying with, with Africa, right, for new Africans here. And so 
it's just funny. Yeah, I think uh, it's funny when you hear people, you know, try to discredit, uh, you know, Africans and American being a, a crucial part to Pan-Africanism. Uh, it's funny when you hear organizers here in the belly of the beast blame the community for not being conscious, not being conscious enough or whatever. You know, uh, for me, uh, it was definitely a battery in my back. And as someone who was, you know, um, born and raised in, in Oakland and shit family been in berkeley for a long time like uh it was definitely a nostalgic moment so yeah shout out to berkeley juneteenth festival yeah i mean uh i think it should just show the potential you know what i mean these type of uh festivals with people wanting to have a, a form of consciousness of at least recognizing uh you know that we should have the fight for freedom and then I think for me, it's just uh, it's more of a message to people who consider themselves to be a part of like a revolutionary cadre of like, what are we doing to be able to activate people uh, day in and day out? You know, because even of, uh, you know, you get a Juneteenth and then it's like hella police. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, whether it's Berkeley police or BART police, you feel me? But then what is the uh, revolutionary cadre is doing to, you know, Activate the community to be like, hey man, why the police? Why are, why is the police here? <laughs> why is bar police here? You know, like what education are we actually doing in the community? Uh, you know, what I'm saying to see see the issue of the police as a as a system. You know, because uh, I think when people talk about abolish the police in 2020, you know, what I'm saying uh, not everyone <laughs> in the new African community is abolitionist. You know, I think they painted a picture of abolition that, in my opinion, was somewhat idealist uh, in terms of actually recognizing the community. And, uh, you know, because you talk to some people in the black community, man, man, we need police, we need safer communities, we need to we need to end crime, you know what I'm saying? And the police is the only way to do it. You know, but I think that's why uh, we have to be in the community uh, doing programs, educating the community to show the people uh, why we are on the brighters, you know what I'm saying, and why the police will never handle, uh, you know, will never be able to handle the issues that we have. You feel me? They're always going to oppress us, and they're an institution that is designed to murder, incarcerate, and kill black people. You feel me? So I think it's important that we uh, be in the community. You know what I mean? Precisely. Because uh, that's otherwise these things are just happening over and over and over again. You feel me? And then these festivals get co-opted into dancing with the cops, just like how the protests was co-opted mm-hmm. to people doing the fucking cha-cha with the National Guard and the police. And I ain't show sure friend, even if they act, act like it, they try to act like it. It's the sneaky ways that they try to do it to be about quote-unquote community. It ain't about community. <laughs> but to your point, though, the thing about these neoliberals and these... Uh what we would consider like reactionary forces like the police, they be outside. They be pulling up. So you can say what you want about these mayors, about these governors, about these fucking uh, they gonna table. pigs. They be outside. They, <laughs> they be knowing table. the people. <laughs> they be knowing the people while motherfuckers just be like, oh, fuck the police from their computer. Mm. Fuck the police from wherever silo they in. It's like, bro, how you gonna convince this person that the police is a reactionary force when they know this police officer on a first name basis, when this police officer been coming up and down their block for ten years, when this police officer was, who knows what the relationships they have? Like, a lot of organizers just want to complain about shit and don't want to get outside and fix the problem. So, like you said, a lot of these things, like if you don't want the police there, you have to develop a relationship with the organizing body so that when you say like, "Hey, y'all, like we're going to do security for this event." Or we're going to do security for your small... We're going to do security for a few events that you have throughout the year leading up to this one moment so that you can garner our trust that we can actually control control the crowd of 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. And how many grassroots organizations even have the capability to do security but then want to complain about the police because security is still a real thing. We uh, we deal with that every single day. I was telling niggas like, hey, y'all might be cool right now, but in 2002, like, niggas used to be up here feeling so unsafe. (laughs) You feel me? Like, like, y'all might be like, yeah, this cool shit cute now, but I'm like, bro, we used to... Just be up there, nigga, going at it. 
You know, but yeah, like you said, safety is still is still an issue. You feel me? Because like, like Jimmy Allen said, not all he, not all humans are just naturally benevolent. You feel me? Not all people are just good. Like the, you feel me? How it's just that's just the case. But yeah, a lot of our problems will be fixed if we just get out into the field and organize, which is what we gonna that's talk why about. My main thing is always <laughs> my main criticism is always towards the people who espouse to be revolutionary, who claim the words. You know what I'm saying? Who want to create revolutionary organization? You know, because if you ain't creating that, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like. That's the biggest problem is you. That's the biggest problem is your organization. Mm-hmm. You feel me? The masses of people, if you ain't doing nothing for them, how do you expect the masses of people to transform from a colonial mentality to a, a revolutionary mentality like to one that is dependent on the state to one that is independent and dependent on the people? You know what I'm saying? Because that's what real you know independence is, is a dependency on the community, a dependency on your neighbors, mm-hmm. a dependency... On your family, you know, mm-hmm. the peoplehood and the familyhood. That's that's independence, not not this pseudo liberal independence that being pushed by the neoliberal machine where they think they independence is independence is being able to do what they want uh, at any time, you know. So I think that's a good transition for this conversation um, of just, I think, the movement in general. I think it's very important that, you know, we tell the truth at every moment. You feel me? Because ultimately, you know, if we think about being future focused, if we think about preparing the next generations of people to organize, Mm -hmm. we have to tell the truth of what's exactly happening at this moment. You feel me? Uh, What the organization is, what the movement is, if there is any movement, you know, that way people in the future who are studying what's going on right now, they can gain some type of clarity uh, about what's going on so they can apply it to the condition that they have now. Right. In the same way, we're able to understand the Black Panther Party to some degree, understand the Black Liberation Army, uh, understand the criticisms that veterans of the movement have had. We only understand that because, A, they talked about it, and B, they wrote about it. You know, so for us, how do we in real time uh, give an analysis to people in the movement right now, but also in the name of history, in the name of each generation advancing itself, of the people in the future looking uh, looking back on the people and the organizations of the past, like what were you doing to address your material situation in this exact epoch of history? And how do we understand your epoch and when in the future they understand the epoch that we have to not make the same mistakes that we did, you yeah. know, and be able to understand uh, oppression, be able to understand colonialism, neocolonialism, imperialism, and what is actual decolonization in 2024 inside the belly of the beast that they call the United States of America. And I, we talked about this a little bit this week. I, it comes at a crucial time, especially um, given like what's happening like internationally in terms of, uh, you know, different resistance movements going on. Uh, of course, the one that's probably getting the uh, most attention is uh, the Palestinian resistance and the axis of resistance uh, throughout the quote unquote Middle East. And also uh, what's happening here in so-called America where, you know, you have uh, the election coming up. And, of course, the Democratic and Republican Party are lobbying as hard as they can for the hearts and minds of the so-called American citizens. Uh, You know, with this, with these two, like, crucial, I guess, things happening, what what we're noticing is a... like a, a a mass like raising of consciousness, and through that raising of consciousness, right, you're going to get uh, either folks who join organizations, you're going to get folks who start new organizations, or you're going to have, um, I guess, like organizations that have been a while, been around for a little while, uh, start to make shifts and adjustments, which is necessary, right, especially because the terrain is always changing. And so I think, yeah, excuse me, providing some context and clarity for the history books. But also trying to give, um, I think, folks that are currently out here some uh, analysis, some tips and pointers from what we've come to understand through our own uh, studying and research over the years. And also, I think, from like our own like empiricism, right, our, our own uh, lived experience as organizers, uh, you know, because what we're going on. Next month, it'll be, is it seven years? Yeah, it'll be seven years, uh, which is a drop in the bucket when you think about it. But we have uh, gone through some things. Uh, I think uh, 
seven years is a lot to somebody who's done nothing. So we can who's just getting started, right? So I think there is within our seven years some stuff that we could uh that we can share to folks. And like you said, there's like we've been saying, there are just a number of reasons why I believe this episode uh is important. Yeah. No, a thousand percent because I think when we think about even the raising of consciousness, right? So people are talking about Palestine in a way uh, you know, what you hear from people and OGs that, you know, were involved in pro Palestine organizing decades ago. They're like, hey, yeah, this is new. Like, man, this is you know, obviously it's a, a different from what was happening in the past, but saying new in the sense that uh a lot of people wasn't talking about Palestine in the way that they are now. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's a you know what we would say is a certain type of fact. <laughs> right. Uh but I think with the consciousness if you're not grounded in some type of foundation, you can gain a consciousness around Palestine. But if your framework of thinking, if your framework of analysis, if your framework of understanding the world is still rooted in a neoliberal capitalist uh, ideology, you are going to take the quote unquote consciousness that you have around Palestine and still package it up uh, and think through a neoliberal way of quote unquote freeing Palestine. You are still going to buy back into this Americanism. Uh, this uh, culture of of Europe rather than actually fully developing a national consciousness rather than fully developing international consciousness to where now people are just going right back into the same what I would say uh, non-profit industrial machine you know what I'm saying the neoliberal machine to where Mm -hmm. it's like hey the same way you know you had the (laughs) Black Lives Matter movement you had the radical consciousness of people then you had these big 501c3s, these big nonprofits, these big pre-existing organizations. Then you have what I would say intelligence agencies then giving money to certain people within the movements uh, to build up new organizations. And then you have electoral campaigns that now take the energy of the masses of the people that was once revolutionary and turn it into the quote unquote ballot box. Right. We see these th- same things happening again where it's like, OK, we're going to do all these types of things in the name of Palestine. Concerts for Palestine. You know, what I'm saying art for Palestine, uh, certain shows for Palestine. But in the reality, what have you actually done to build a revolutionary cadre uh, to build something that actually can actually challenge uh, the United States of America that could actually challenge U.S. imperialism because you see it all the time from the resistance. They always say that the so-called the Zionist entity is not just this rogue state. Mm -hmm. The Zionist entity is supported by America. If America didn't have all of the military bases that it had within the region of West Asia, within uh, North Africa, within East Africa, right? Because if you look at a map, you know exactly where Palestine is (laughs) on the border of Egypt, (laughs) which Mm -hmm. borders Africa. If America didn't have that imperialist power, the Zionist occupation would not be able to exist, right? So what are we doing here inside of the belly of the beast to actually develop a proper analysis to actually free the land here and to actually challenge U.S. imperialism to where, you feel me, people in West Asia uh, have actual support, you feel me? Because you just yelling at the oppressor. You just, you know, Cabral talks about you just throwing slogans at the oppressor <laughs> and bad words at them. What is that going to do to get you your freedom? I mean, even if it's, at some point you're not even doing that because a lot of us, if you look at the contextualization of uh, what Cabral might have been talking about at that time in the, in, in the uh, 60s and 70s, he might have been talking about people being on the streets yelling. But most of, sometimes people just be on their phone talking to uh, bots or other folks on their phone, right? Uh, but yeah, you hit, you hit the nail on the head. Like if I had to think about like the top advice I would give organizers and organizations is like what you just essentially said in terms of like, identifying objectives and and defining ideology, right? Because if you don't have those two things, this is how at any given moment you can be unwittingly funneled into a a reactionary process or a reactionary uh, system or industry, right? So this is where you talk about if you don't have a proper, uh, if you haven't defined your ideology as a cadre, even if you're a one-person cadre, right? Like if you just as an individual, if you haven't defined your ideology, then you'll find yourself uh, falling victim to anarchy, liberalism, fascism, and anything else, right, to where you just at any given moment being put into any system. And so by defining your ideology, then you can at least def- are able to say, like, there is just a, sp- a specific set of protocols that I can follow given this ideology based off, like, if you say, oh, I'm a revolutionary nationalist, then there's just, like, a history of how you're supposed to function as a revolutionary nationalist, as someone who wants to have a nation for revolutionary purposes. And that means that I must be anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, right? 
or you might say um, whatever ideology you want to throw around, but there's just like certain practice and principles you have to put around, right? If you're a revolutionary nationalist and you're anti-capitalist, you're anti-imperialist, that means you can you want to reject the systems and processes of a capitalist society, right? So that will make you question the, it should make you question and uh, denounce the electoral process. So how can one talk about being revolutionary, but they're constantly uh, lobbying and pushing people towards electoral politics, right? So if you define your ideology, then boom, you have, again, uh, a foundation that you can work from that can be rooted in history and help you make sense of your present day. And then you also talked about like identifying objectives. Like what is it, what is it that you're trying to achieve, achieve, achieve? Like, okay, you have your ideology, which tells you what you believe in. And usually that belief uh, leads you to a final point of something that you would seek to establish. Now, what is the process of how, how you get there? One of the things you just named was having an analysis, right? And so when I think about, uh, again, tips, uh, defining ideology, uh, identifying objectives and you hit the number three one that i would give is like getting educated bro <laughs> like we talk about it like i think political education people have to start to understand it outside of like reading and cadre uh like circles and talks like uh, education has to be about like every element of your life like get educated on how uh, these reactionary ideologies of capitalism, of Zionism, of uh, colonialism, birth institutions, how they birth uh, your understanding of self and your relationship to others, what they will call political economy, right? Like, get it familiar with that shit. Get familiar with it so that you can uh, develop a new way of thinking. But this can only come through, I would say, like a staunch political education process that isn't just uh, solely books. I think some of our political education has even come through. Uh, not think I know some of our political education has been a byproduct of like damn near like spirituality too. You know, <laughs> like you can't just reduce it to books. I think uh, uh, I know another part of our political education has been our relationships to like uh, like family. Like when I think about what the Tales of the Town project did for us, you feel me? And like actually like becoming new humans. You know, like. You've seen the way we've like, I mean, I, I think it comes with, comes with being older too, but you know, we've def definitely stepped into like the male role of our family in a lot different way. And I think it's, I, to, I don't know, just based off the conversation that you and I've had, I think it's from hearing the stories of like our great, great grandfathers and hearing the stories of our great, great grandmothers and our aunties and uncles. And you know, it's like, I, to me, I consider that political education. Becoming men yeah. in a society that teaches men to not be men. Yeah. You feel me? Like, <laughs> talk about actual manhood you know cause or just full human shit you yeah, feel manhood like, and then gain, but through your manhood you gain your humanity mm -hmm. because of what do they try to do and what have they done for decades for centuries is strip us of what our manhood strip us of what masculinity strip us of what a sense of self strip us of what a self a uh, sense of purpose that's part of the war so when you gain that sense of purpose you gain that sense of understanding of how you should actually be acting in the society, be actually acting with yourself and in the world. You feel me? That should be a, a, a process of being reborn <laughs> to where you gain a sense of national consciousness, a sense of international con consciousness, and a <laughs> sense of self-consciousness. You feel me? That's like, real though, You know, because it's like, how much are we actually removed from our bodies in some way, not to get all deep and nah, physical, nah, right? But, but the like colonial system and actually removes us from ourself to where we're not actually, you feel me, aligned with ourselves, you feel me, mentally, <laughs> spiritually, you know what I'm saying, in a holistic manner, physically, right? We're just so uh, emerged with our sense of self to where we see ourselves as the center of the universe. But when you do that, you're actually removing yourself mm -hmm. from who you actually are mm -hmm. as a person. And you have this level of multiple personalities based off of the conditions that you're living in you feel me because you're not actually anchored to your own heart you're removed from it mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying so i think uh in you know like a decade of organizing and it's interesting, you know, going back and, you know, rereading Sophia Bakari, you know, I'm like, man, I wish I read that well, as one of the first books mm -hmm. because she talks about that internal revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, she talks about, yeah, COINTELPRO happened, but our biggest enemies 
was oftentimes ourselves. And I'll say in a decade of organizing, like from a scientific analysis and the different organizations that I've been and the different coalition spaces I've been in and the different movement spaces I've been in, I would say the biggest enemy has been ourselves. And some people are going to take uh, a problem with uh, why I said that. I'm just going to ask you, to, you know, like the OG Amir said, man, think with me. You don't got to think like me. But I would say to my own experience, my own scientific observation, and then this is also backed up by people who are saying this in the party and the BLA, is it's been ourselves. It's been our inability uh, to change ourselves. It's been our inability to gain a, a level of consciousness uh, that actually looks internally. You know, like uh, if we look at it from a Islamic perspective, and this early on when I became Muslim, I think this was like a harder uh thing for me to understand, especially for us, you know, coming from this uh, secular science, you know, to some degree uh, of movement building, you know, we're always taught like this material world, right? This, uh, this movement, the space that we're in, like, this is what's most, this is what's so primary, right? Um, that, you know, we got to be able to, you know, fight the man and fight the people and fight the nation and fight this nation that's oppressing us. But we don't talk about how we actually have to fight ourselves. How we actually have to struggle against ourselves, you know? And I was like, "Oh, the the greater jihad is the jihad itself." Like, what? Like, man, we gotta <laughs> we gotta wage jihad against these the police, man. We gotta <laughs> wage jihad against the system. But then over time, I'm realizing if we can't even struggle against ourselves, if we can't even purify our own hearts, our own tongues, our own hands, our own minds, our own ways of being, our own ways of acting, if we can't even do that with ourselves. How foolish and how arrogant can we be to think that we could actually deal with an oppressor that is the most oppressive system known to humanity that we have seen. We are dealing with the modern day Pharaoh, but we can't struggle against ourselves, you know, but we want to be able to do everything else. We want to be able to help other people. We want to be able to, quote unquote, heal other people, but you ain't even working to heal yourself. You ain't even working to transform yourself. You ain't worrying. You ain't even worried about yourself to some degree you just become about other people and you become about the movement but won't transform the level of being the level of acting that is required to essentially be in a movement in my opinion because that's the biggest problem is that we don't go into this movement and try and transform ourselves but we try to transform everyone a lot of times right i'm not going to speak in absolutes we try to transform this whole system but we can't transform ourselves so what do we deal with in organizing? Because you can't transform your tongue, <laughs> you feel because you won't struggle against your own tongue and your own way of thinking, what are you doing? You're backbiting. What are you doing? You're gossiping. What are you doing? You're letting petty grievances control the way you think about the movement. What are you doing? You're spreading lies. You're spreading seeds of dissension. You're, uh, what they call it, snitch jacketing. <laughs> you're doing all these things. All these things because you ain't dealt with your own self. <laughs> you ain't dealt with your own emotions. You ain't coming from a, a sober mindset, even though you might be sober off of alcohol. So the failure to do that then leads to what? <laughs> Destroying the movement because now your little petty disagreement is now turning into something that's a movement thing, but really that's something that's just about yourself. And how you have an inability to handle conflict. I mean, you said it earlier, and again, people might disagree, but uh, you're not wrong in saying that, like, ultimately, people have to take responsibility for their actions. And that is a pathway, the, one of the first steps to this thing of decolonization that people keep talking about, right? Like, is actually like decolonizing uh, the self. And yeah, people don't realize how at any given moment this like how your failure to address yourself can spread like a cancer through an organization. Like that that's just the fact. Your failure to handle your personal business will spread like a cancer. So whether what you're talking about is like the more uh intra is when it's with yourself or is it inter? Intra. <laughs> I mean the, the energy head. 
No, I'm saying not, not energy. I'm talking about. I was going to like use introverse interpersonal, mm. right? One one or the other, right? So no, like, no, you no, have okay. intro. I think is with yourself, right? So like whether like the, the intro or the interpersonal, yeah. uh, that shit spreads like a cancer if you ain't able mm. to take first take responsibility for your actions. Uh, and again, I think this can all be connected to political education, right? People always talk about oh, we need to have a holistic approach to things. Well, have a holistic approach to your political education. Like, you'll have somebody who is so versed can tell you everything about what's going on in the political realm, but they are just nasty people. Like, they're just not, you feel me? Like, you try to, like, I, I, you'll try to work with some of these people, and it's like, damn, like, how do you know everything but how to engage with decency and respect to uh, your fellow person? And then people have the, the, the nerve to throw around terms like comrade. And it's like, bro, you can't even treat that's people with respect. Even, I don't use that word like that. I mean, I use that word very, very sparingly. I mean, it's very, earned. very sparingly. It's earned, even if it's like uh, I, I might be remembering history wrong, but I understand comrade to be uh, a term that's addressed with like uh, armed struggle, right? Like with um, hey, like damn near like combatants, right? And combatants earn each other's trust through whether it's like your first camp. And then from there through your first live action, you know, like this, it's a term that's earned. And so I think, uh, again, anyone that's dedicated to like what I, and then, I mean, I, we've lived it, right? Like I think about me becoming a more principled, more positive person. It has yielded, it, it has been shown in a way that I'm able to show up in the organization, you know, like being conscious of how I'm feeling. Like, and I think, uh, should tips that I would give another organization is like, in addition to having your ideology, like have your systems and processes, right? Like have uh, something that a boss has been alluding to could be uh, simply summarized as like a process of criticism and self-criticism, right? Number one, um, and it's like, I, I believe again, if I'm not misremembering history, like uh, Mao Zedong and, and the Chinese Communist Party is like the ones that have helped push that forward for a lot of people during the National Liberation Era. Uh, and they talk about criticism and self-criticism, but self-criticism coming first. Excuse me, like being able to look at yourself and recognize how you might be showing up, how you might be contributing to something uh, before you offer it to anybody else. And then also when people offer you criticism, uh, Jalil Mutakin talks about looking at it as like as a gift, like somebody awakening you to uh, how you can be better. And again, uh, I think this is necessary for anyone talking about decolonization is first being aware with yourself of like your weaknesses uh, and then also, you know, having a process and being able to talk with yourself and hold yourself accountable uh, to this. But political ed political education is key. Uh, I think Abbas's political education is why he's able to give you analysis like he gave in terms of, like, OK, like this is what Sophia Bakari and members of the Black Panther Party and BLA were saying. Uh, and this is why I value self-criticism, why I value that inner jihad, whether you're referencing the world before or you're referencing the Quran, you have these historical bases to help you form your analysis uh, and make sense of your material present reality. Um, and like political education is important, y'all. We have to elevate it. It's time to elevate it and to recognize it for what it truly is. It's not just about books and understanding uh, definitions and being able to speak to different global uh, current events and phenomena. It's having a full approach, right? Even if we talk about, break the word up, right? Well, political. Uh, for me, it just means politics. And I like to use uh, how Sanyika Shakur and like Yaki present politics, right? Like all matters centered on life, right? And then you talk about education, becoming knowledgeable, becoming, knowledgeable, becoming aware, right? So you must become knowledgeable and aware of all elements of life. It ain't just about political theory. It ain't just about that. You have to, or even yeah. political theory goes outside whatever terms. It becomes about like your literal entire existence in the way that you're showing up. That's yeah. political education. I, and that, you know, the criticism and self-criticism, I think that's a very important point. And it's, I would say, oftentimes echoed on the left. But what I would say in terms of that, what happens is people will mention criticism and self-criticism, but then when they are presented with criticism, they act with an emotional outburst. They don't receive the criticism. They find an excuse in every aspect of the criticism. That's why that key part of criticism is self-criticism. 
If you don't have the ability to engage in some type of self-criticism, if someone is handing you criticism, you ain't even going to be able to actually take that criticism as a gift because you're failing to do that work of self. And that's what happens a lot uh, within organizations is the inability to look at self, to step outside of one's ego, to step outside of one's individualist nature, and instead actually ask yourself, why is this being given to me? Right? And then people are like, hey, man, we ain't doing no criticisms. We ain't, we ain't talk. It's like, man, because you can't handle it. Why would I give you something if you can't even handle it? And history is proving through the scientific process that you can't handle no criticisms. It always becomes something personal because you ain't wor- worrying about yourself. Right? That's a big part of it. You know, to transition a little bit, you know, looking at. Uh, oh, before we go, there's one thing I want to say about criticism, self criticism. Especially if we're using this as like a guide and tip to people. No, yeah, I was gonna, it's the same topic. Okay, keep go going. ahead there. No, you go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say like criticism and self criticism is a skill that's developed over time. Because even if I go back to like my first, I mean, you can look at the 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 familial like. I could look at like my my nucleus or what they call like is your nuclear family that's like your immediate family like with your parents like mm-hmm. siblings right if you look at like so yeah for me like my nuclear family was it could definitely be uh stated as like my first experience with criticism self criticism but I want to move past that to like I guess like my like where I where I would consider like organized effort like on a mass scale is like team sports right and so when I first started getting criticisms uh you know so some people don't get introduced to criticisms until they well into their adulthood you know, in, in this type of way where it's like you're working for a team and you have to, uh, even though, the, again, the familial aspect can be that if that's the way you was raised. Some people are raised in a way in their families where they get to be individuals and they don't have to worry about how their things impact their parents or their siblings or their cousin. Like they just, that's how they was raised. I, that wasn't mine. And I think me being the oldest has something to do with that. And poor, like you have to, <laughs> everything is about the unit, right? Uh, so, so for some people who don't have that situation uh, where it's not about the unit, they get to be very much centered on themselves and taken care of, uh, some of them don't get that experience till they get into their first team, right? And so, uh, again, talking about, like, team sports, I remember my, my coaches first getting on me and I always had an excuse every single time because I took it personal. And, yeah, I might have been 11 years old, you feel me, 10 years old, but I, I took it, like, looking back, took it personal. Or even when I got to high school, you feel me? And it's like now the expectation is being raised. So the things that they might have been letting me get away with on the youth level uh, – I can't get away with on on the high school level now. So now I'm getting open to a whole new series of criticisms and like this other behavior that I thought that was okay. Now it's no longer okay. And when my coach is saying something to me, uh, you know, uh, I always got something to say back versus like him being the coach and the leader and the ex. Not even, I guess like just like the leader, not even, I guess you can consider it like an expert, right? Whatever. But him being the leader and me always having to say something when he gives me a criticism. And then, boom, I get used to just saying, yes, yes, coach, and then watching the film and looking at myself and, like, seeing what he's seeing, trying to see what he's seeing in me uh, and, where, and where I'm going wrong. And then that leads to, like, uh, me being able to perform better and show up better because he's giving me these criticisms, these gifts to help me be a better player. Then you get to the college level. And, okay, now what was allowed in high school ain't allowed in college. Now I got to get used to this new level of criticism. And, uh, and yeah, so I think uh, – People too often say that they're ready for something without being reared for it, right? So if you've been a person who haven't been, who hasn't been reared for like assessment, and I know you remember how film could be like embarrassing as fuck. You know that play coming up, like, you know, you know not, not everybody else might have saw it in the game. You it would have happened, remember that play, but you know it's coming up. And then you know what you did. And then sometimes you hoping your coach don't see it. But why wouldn't and- he? <laughs> <laughs> but, why wouldn't? He? Oh my god! But then- you gotta, but you have to deal with that feeling, right? Of like. No, like you all like you, you hella mad. You feel me? You nigga having a very visceral you experience. Nervous. You nervous. You know the nigga about to say something. Your teammates laughing, and that happens to you when you what? You when I get to practice today, I bet I don't do that shit again. You know, like you you, you either do that or you sit in the back and pout. You feel me? You then you on the bench. You know it's it, so. I say that not to excuse people's behavior, but I'm just saying like we all have got to go through this process, um, and so I just encourage people. And want to ground you on the fact that it's going to come up, partly because uh, we've been conditioned in the West for mistakes to be embarrassing, for mistakes to be fatal, versus understanding that we're all human and we're going to make mistakes. Uh, and the goal is to sit with the mistake, analyze the mistake, and move forward positively. 
But if you can't sit with yourself like that and come to that, anything I say to you ain't going to matter. If you can't sit here and say, like, yo, this person is really sitting here trying to give me something so that we can move forward positively as a unit to do what you just said earlier, take on the biggest enemy that this planet Earth has ever seen, shaitan in a material form. That's what this person is telling me this for. If you can't do that, then it's, what are we talking about here? Let's just be real. Let's just be <laughs> honest. Let's not be delusional. You feel me? Like, let's actually not be delusional. If we can't do this... Uh, Small work in the grand scheme of things that's happening. You was just delusional thinking you actually going to deal with an enemy that is well trained. Deal with an enemy that is uh, <laughs> economically a power, politically a power, socially a power, and has some of the most advanced weaponry uh, known to man. And ideologically in power. Because you, them, them, you go to the National Guard, they commander tell them what to do. Hey, you... They gonna, sir, yes, sir. You feel me? So we can say they damn near ideologically superior. So it's a, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the governing us right now. So that's, <laughs> you feel me? But that's the thing. I think people, uh, people don't want to take leadership. That's a part of the individualism is people don't want to take leadership. Uh, people don't want to listen. And I say this as a part of like this psyop. People also don't want to listen to men. That's also a thing. <laughs> In general, there's this, this psyop, especially on new African men is, oh, you know, you're oppressive, you're this, you're that, and they don't want to take <laughs> leadership from men. Now, not everyone, but that is a, a general theme because of this uh, reactionary uh, intersectionality that is being pushed in the in this reactionary feminism that is being pushed uh, to where these new African men are trash, these new African men are your oppressors, these new African men are the patriarchs of white supremacy, right? So that also becomes an issue. Uh, but yeah, that's why I, I thought it was so weird, bro. Like when I was finishing like my athletic career up and going into the workforce and I'm like, where's the feedback? <laughs> I used to have to go to like my boss and be like, can I get some feedback? Like, am I doing good? Like what's happening? You feel because I was so used to, and again, you know, I, I went to and played on, you know, very historic sports programs where it's like you either get with the program or you gone and nobody cares because that's how good the program is. We'll find somebody else. You feel me? Like, they'll be like, man, well, even if you're not that athletic, if you follow the program, you're proven to win. You're mm -hmm. proven to, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's how developed it was for me, where I was like, man, I wanted that feedback because I knew, like, hey, I knew my coach won championships. I knew my coach has done this before. So for me, I'm like, man, I'm trying, you feel me? I'm, I'm trying to be the best I could be. You know what I'm saying? By the time I'm in high school, you know, because that are, you know, you go to, uh, Playing Pop Warner is like, all right, you, you just going to deal with it. <laughs> you know, that's where I got most of my emotional stuff out for the most part, at least in terms of, like, coaching. You know what I'm saying? You, by the time you're in high school, it's like you, you either get with it or get gone for real. You know, but I think that's discipline from team sports and being on a team. That is uh, understanding the feedback, you feel me? Because you're going to get that in a film session. You're going to get that in practice. You're going to get that in probably, you know, I played for coaches who uh, – you know, you used to coach military. You feel me? So they had whole types of military hierarchy within the organization and even military type of communication <laughs> within it. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's a, a people in general, you know, especially in the revolutionary nationalists, uh, uh, the rejection of leadership and the rejection of, of hierarchy uh, is a very dangerous individualist neoliberal trend. Um, but, you know, Going back to the point I was going to make is, you know, when things were happening to, in, in, in Philistine uh, and seeing some of this destruction visually that, I, you know, a lot of people have never seen before, you know, and seeing what's happening in this genocide, you know, it's the most inhumane, uh, satanic uh, type of aggression on, on, on Palestinian people, on, on Muslims. And, you know, people... We're posting this ayat in the Quran. It's a rough English translation. It says, Allah says in the Quran, uh, Verily Allah will not change the condition of a people until you change what's within yourself. Right? This like ayat of the Quran. Mm -hmm. and people are like, why are you posting this at this time? I'm like, I mean, first of all, I, you know, that's Allah's words. So if, <laughs> Allah, you can, <laughs> that's what Allah said. <laughs> like, oh, it was so disingenuous. I was like, nah, it's actually very, very real. Very, very real. And if we apply that 
I add to our day to day beings of, of in general, like if you ain't changing what's within yourself, how do you expect the law to change your condition? And if you think about the resistance in Philistine, it's because they're changing the condition of themselves that they're able to wage this war to be able to wage a war of national independence. Being able to wage a, a war to stop the genocide is because they've changed the condition of themselves to when our law is helping them. To where you're talking about the Zionist entity, the Zionist occupation forces being uh, advanced so much technology, technologically, quote unquote, superior to the Islamic resistance in, in Philistine. But you've seen the Islamic resistance being able to resist a beast that is on paper so much more superior, a David versus Goliath. And they've been able to uh, resist in a way that is historic. They've been able to have historic achievements. Why? It's because they've changed what's within they self. And now Allah is helping them. If we look at the Islamic resistance in, in Lebanon, you know, part of, part of a criteria for them to even be uh, waging to be a, a mujahideen, to be a, a, a soldier, is that you have to go through the greater jihad. That is like a precondition to waging the smaller jihad, the jihad against the oppressors. And I think that's really deep because, <laughs> uh, and why are they successful right now? Why is Islamic res resistance successful right now? It's because that's what they're engaged in. They're engaged in the transformation itself. They're engaged in that uh, energy had, right? So for me, the lessons I take, especially upon like the 10 years of organizing and we think about political education, right? And how we define it is the, the whole aspect of yourself, the whole aspect of your life, the whole aspect, I would say, of your material and spiritual reality, right? If we understand that, to me, organizations need to develop a way that people can come in and transform and engage in that internal struggle. Engage, if you're Muslim, engaging in that jihad akbar. You feel me in, that, in the, the greater jihad. You know what I'm saying? Because if we don't, we are going to fail. If we don't, we are going to still mimic these people that we're claiming to fight against. If we don't, we're going to have infighting. If we don't, we're going to have gossip. If we don't, we're going to have backbiting. If we don't, we're going to have individualism. If we don't, we're going to be so consumed with self that we think we're the center of the universe. If we don't, we will fail. <laughs> so that's the recommendation that I have is like we have to create a real program, mm -hmm. a scientific program that allows people to engage in that type of struggle. You know, and I think uh, for the Muslims, <laughs> it is waging that greater jihad. It's being rooted in that day in and day out so that we can actually struggle uh, in the way that Allah uh, intended us as Muslims. Yeah, bro, I think you're spot on, right? Like, what you've, what you've offered is a very balanced approach, right? Uh, you've put the onus on the individual, but you've also put the onus on the organization, right? Like organizations also have to provide the space for people to transform. And that's why I think defined objectives, defined ideologies, defined systems and processes and community values and the community agreements, like the, this is a pathway to which we say like, yo, here is the way that we transform and here are the processes and the systems that we've created as a group for this thing to happen. But it also is going to take the number one thing is individual buy-in. Organization can talk about ideology, can create systems and processes, standards. But if we as individuals don't fully commit to them, then it's um, performative at best. Like we just perform this process of creating this thing, which if if used can be a like people laugh at community agreements. But like if you look at our community agreements, like some basic like. Uh, you know, respect all people. Be aware of how you feeling and how you showing up in the space. Like if I'm coming in, if I'm having a rough, a rough ass day, and I'll step through that door, and we about to do our grocery program, I need to recognize like, oh, my energy is off, and the commitment is to show up in a very revolutionary way, or don't come. 
You from, we ain't even sure, saying that you got to be there. We said you can stay at home. We said you can stay at home. Just do your work and don't say nothing. You <laughs> just, <laughs> just get your work done. <laughs> or, you know, like, it's just like, That's real, but it though. takes it takes individual buy-in. But I appreciate, again, how what I valued about the organization, uh, people's programs specifically, that when, when I say the organization, our organization, uh, is that we actually have uh, made the constant effort to provide the spaces of transformation whether you're talking about weekly political education uh whether you're talking about conflict mediation whether you're talking about excuse me uh whether you're talking about uh constantly refining updating community agreements uh like these are real pathways for people to step into that process of transformation it's like what uh fanon talks about in the wretched of the earth is like uh the colonized thought that they would go from the colonized to the decolonized uh, without that process of transformation, right? Like, it's going to be a battle of transformation. And the biggest transformation that a, a individual, a, col a colonized subject can make is that process from an individual to the collective, like what you're talking about with uh, Hezbollah, right? Like, it's like that's what you you have to go what you talked about with Cal and De La Salle like when you put this jersey on that's why De La didn't have the last names on the back of the jersey for so long yeah they, 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 you like, feel me? Like, just they start like, here they let us do it they're like yeah man cause they're like they recognize though the program you know what I'm saying they mm -hmm. recognize the team they also recognize I thought it was dope the individual and mm -hmm. how the individual is also choosing to be a part of this team mm -hmm. and to be bigger than the last name on your back but to also but be, that's after you feel me? But that's 40 after. years of establishing like this comes first so you don't even when you six years old you when you in sixth grade you thinking about going to De La Salle you recognize before, like when I get there I'm a part of the program so yeah I got this last name you on my back I am an you feel like we've already you can you can do whatever you want now yeah. you can you can have you can yeah, be an individual because we've already the systems already exist forty years proven that when you get into this motherfucker you are Spartan first yeah period. When you step on the field, you a Spartan. Then you can be whatever else. You play for your parents in the stands and shit. But ultimately, you play for when you come into that weight room and it's all them. That, it's, this is this is what we about here. You feel me? And so, um, yeah. If I if I had to just go over the things we have identified so far, because I know we're a little hour in, I don't think we're done yet. Some of the things we talked about is identifying objectives and defining ideology. Uh, tips for organizers, organizations that already exist, new ones. Uh, identifying objectives and defining ideology having a holistic political education approach and understanding political education as a a full human body spiritual mind communal individual experience uh being self-aware and going through the process of criticism and self-criticism recognizing those things as a gift uh dealing with the inner contradictions uh and islam is referred to as that as jihad al-nas right yeah the, yeah, yeah. the internal mm -hmm. uh, part of the greater jihad yeah uh, provide and accept space for change. Um, providing being from the organization or the organizer organizers, but accepting number one, uh, the acceptance. So the the providing of the space needs to come from the organization as a whole. The accepting of the process for change has to come from the individual organizers. Uh, and another thing we named earlier, which I think we need to go into because I don't want people to just take that out of context and <laughs> is not getting caught up in uh, identity politics, right? Uh, when Abbas is talking about uh, reactionary intersectionality um what i'm seeing it as how we've come to understand it as an organization um is like people using identity as a means to be unprincipled right uh when we talk about reactionary feminism uh it's people using uh their position at, or women using the stance that uh, only women can lead only women are naturally benevolent and the process uh deeming men as this naturally uh, reactionary force and that's just not true if you look at the Black Panther Party for example which uh, here in the United States of America so called United States of America is could be considered one of the most uh, revolutionary programs put forth uh, which gave way to, to the Black Liberation Army right um, you hear people like Asada you hear people like Sophia you hear people like Erica Huggins talk about um, you know um with their male counter with their male comrades how they were able to work um in tandem you know too often you hear them talk you hear the stories of the women of the panthers only talk about, talk about like the negative shit right and people will talk bring this up under the guise of like historical materialism understanding history understanding that we were only claiming to understand that we were what 
just a few generations removed from slavery where the relationship between uh, new African men and women was one of uh, shit subjugation orchestrated by the slave master. Uh, we can go even further into that. But yeah, people just often present, and people don't realize how this reactionary intersectionality, this reactionary feminism is pushed up by the state, by the fascists as a means to divide and conquer. And so when, a, when we saying is, a, don't get caught up in that because regardless of- Olympics that they always try to push. Regardless of your race, gender, the, sexuality, the nation. you can fall into the ethos of capitalist imperialism. You can be a reactionary force. Non-men are just not naturally benevolent. That's period. I know y'all see it when y'all see them fucking Israelis waving them flags. I know y'all see it when y'all see uh, them fucking, you, you see any, any gender, ability, race, creed, pushing fascist policies. Yeah, I mean, if we say we always hear your skin folk ain't kin folk, okay. That applies to everything else. <laughs> that applies to your gender. <laughs> You feel me? That applies to yeah. <laughs> it applies to it all. I mean, and, and that's just what it is. Like, it's just it's just the facts, and so. Uh, is Kamala Harris your ally because she's because a woman? She a woman? Because you know? she's a new African. What was Barack Obama, Obama your ally because he's a new African? What does that even mean? But again, that's what they try to do. They use that as a weapon, as a psychological weapon to keep the neo-colonial system uh, still in order so that we are doing what? Waging this infighting, this infighting on identity, this infighting on what they want us to be <laughs> rather than being revolutionary. And that's what's happening because even if we look at the Zionist occupation force, people, you know, talk about, uh, you know, uh, oh, you know, the one thing that's came up is like they'll try to use like anti-blackness as a weapon for people to not support Palestine. Like, oh, you know, the Arabs are anti-black, right? We know anti-blackness as a global phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is, it's African people in Philistine, it's, it's black Palestinians being oppressed by Zionists. And what does it mean when they use uh, the Israelis, the Zionist occupation, I don't even recognize Israel, the Zionist occupation, uses an Ethiopian Jew to kill an Arab Palestinian. What do you call that? <laughs> right? So they'll use whoever for their system to do that job for the system. We've got to understand that. What do we call that? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So I use that example because I think that's a, one example of how even they'll use like anti-blackness as this identity mm -hmm. or blackness as an identity and anti-blackness as this uh, racist superior almost type of thinking uh, without actually looking at the whole phenomenon that is happening. No, nah, that's, a, that's a great example of reactionary identity politics. Like, that, that, that is a perfect example. So I hope people are able to, uh, like you said earlier, think with us and not just have whatever visceral response to we say like all women ain't naturally benevolent and all men ain't just naturally oppressors. I don't, like that's just the reality. <laughs> that's just all queer folks ain't just naturally uh, benevolent. That's just not the case. It's niggas out. Every, every, you feel me? Everybody want in the, regardless of race, gender, creed, religion. There are some people who want a piece of that capitalist pie. It's people want to be oppressors. <laughs> just, that's that's just, just, a fact. just like whether they're oppressing <laughs> themselves or they want to oppress other people. That's what happens throughout humanity. Throughout humanity, that has always been the case. People oppressing themselves and people oppressing people oppressing other people. So, are you going to be an oppressor to yourself, and are you going to be an oppressor to other people? You got to ask yourself that. Because <laughs> I say I've oppressed myself before. <laughs> mm -hmm. The la the last one I, that comes to my mind in terms of uh like tips that I would give people is and we're gonna expand is necessary because again I think you said you don't want to speak in, in absolutes uh but one of them is build coalition right but yeah boss made the point earlier of like the nonprofit industrial complex and what people haven't realized like what the nonprofit industrial complex does and people I mean some what we have to talk about, not what people fail to realize, I guess some people might fail, but what we have to talk about is how the nonprofit industrial complex 
is designed to create siloed work as a means to produce inefficient uh inefficient product as we if we understand that as an industry right the the final goal is to produce programs that actually don't fully reach their capacity or reach uh don't fully serve the needs of the people right if we know neoliberalism and the nonprofit industrial complex to be synonymous right to be tied in and neoliberalism uh, as a phenomenon seeks to uh privatize uh, state institutions and jobs that the government should be doing. So you have these free food pr programs ran by nonprofits. You have these shelters ran by nonprofits. All these different programs, right, that the state should be actually running. Uh, the goal of the nonprofit industrial complex as a neoliberal uh, phenomenon is to get people to do work that never fully addresses the contradictions, that never fully meets the needs of the people. And the way that we can start to combat that in a way is by coalition building, right? We talk, y'all might have heard this, might have heard us talk about this before as it pertains to Oakland alone. Let's just say West Oakland. There has to be 10 plus groups running free food programs. There is, in fact, just in West Oakland, which West Oakland ain't from shit, the lower bottoms to ghost town. So you're talking about all lower bottoms acorns right so you start getting into like 7th street up to apgar right that's not like a lot of, it's not it's not a huge area right and from san pablo or from uh let's say telegraph to like mandela below mandela actually so mm -hmm. we're over by the freeway and shit uh, past chase and all that uh, when i say chase i mean chase street um uh, <laughs> uh for people who don't understand the Bay <laughs> But it's just not a lot Over the Chase Center <laughs> I say all that to say It's just not that big of an area It's definitely Small. enough That 10 organizations Small. should be able to provide For all the people If we are scientifically organized But we're not uh, And I'll Again the nonprofit industrial complex And capitalist individualism All plays a part in it So where you have People feel like there's not enough funding for everyone. You have different EDs of nonprofits that don't want to give up their position of power. It's like when Nkrumah was trying to federate all of Africa, you had different prime ministers and presidents asking, well, what does that mean for my, for my position? Like, nigga, for your position, what about Africa? <laughs> you feel me? Like, we talking about the continent here, buddy. You talking about your, your little position, right? Uh, so I would say reach out to people and try to coalition build because we need... Uh, we need to corral all the positive forces, but with that coalition building, you know, you just got to be careful because, you know, not everybody is. Uh, People want to claim to be in coalition until your organization starts to do, quote unquote, more work and they see that as a threat to their funding. That's what I'm saying. Not everybody's going to take a liking to you coming in here, especially a few some young. of the older folks sometimes, you know, yeah. like older, older folks. Um, we've been talking about this. In another city that we're organizing in, you know, like another city in the Bay Area, asking folks like, "What does it need? Me, what does it need to happen for the organizers to become more intergenerational?" Because it seems like just a lot of elders are leading the work. And one of the elders who have been organizing in this locale for shit, you know, fifty plus years, is like, "Man, we as elders got to be willing to get out the way and, and succeed power." And we here in Oakland have seen like that. that ain't always the case, you know. People uh. Because again, the nonprofit industrial complex, people have started gotten used to living certain lifestyles <laughs> based off the work that they do. You know, have gotten certain careers and they don't want to give those up in the name of the people. Mm -hmm. You know, they. Pick, mm -hmm. I mean, because I think coalitions and developing a united front is something that can actually, you know, heal the wound. You know, Malcolm talked about that knife in you. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? You pull it out seven inches, you know, that ain't, that ain't nothing, man. You got to pull that knife out completely. You feel me? Uh, building a united front it allows us to pull that knife out completely and to, to heal ourselves. But a lot of times these nonprofits, they want to put a Band-Aid on a gaping wound because why that gaping wound is still going to give them what? Funding. <laughs> that blood money still going to come in, so it's still going to uh, feed their life that they have under capitalism. They still prefer the crumbs of capitalism versus uh, a revolution that empowers the uh, all people. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so building United Front is very important, but I would say the United Front has to have uh, shared values, uh, shared agreements, 
Um, because what can happen in coalition type of spaces is, uh, you know, sometimes these organizations, uh, what they will do because they see you as a threat, then they, you feel me, they ain't engaging in the type of behavior that is trying to uh, put mud on your name. You feel me? They is engaging in lies. They is engaging in whisper campaigns uh, in order to delegitimize the actual organizing that is happening. You feel me? Uh, and you got to ask them, why are they doing this? Because they see you as a threat. They either see you as a threat or their organization has other intentions and is funded by other intentions. If you catch my drift. <laughs> And only time will reveal. But time reveals always, you know, time always tells everything. You know, the truth. <laughs> we know the truth. Where's the drag going? <laughs> you know, but we got to build United Fronts. That's what happened. That's what has to happen. And they will do everything to stop that from happening. They, by they, I'm talking about the state. But how do we develop the inner fortitude? How do we develop the principles? How do we put the principles? How do we, you know, uh, put the politics in command? How do we put the, you know, people... Uh, and the people's aspirations and command and actually build a united front because the Black Panther Party, what were they doing? They was building a united front. They was developing the American Indian movement. They was working with the Brown Berets. They was developing the Brown Berets. You feel me? They was uh, developing the Young Lords. You feel me? They was uh, building the Yellow Peril. You feel me? They was developing a united front against capitalist imperialism. And what do we have to do right now is develop a united front against capitalist imperialism in 2024 that's what we have to do we have to see our common humanity and develop a front that will liberate our common humanity and see the uh way that okay if this is happening to human beings this is going to happen to me at some point mm -hmm. you feel me seeing that interconnectedness uh of us being human beings mm -hmm. and seeing each other as humans should uh, uh change the way we interact with ourselves interact with each other and then ultimately we should join up <laughs> And fight for our common humanity. You feel me? Uh, and that's a humanitarian project. That's the truest form of humanitarianism. It's fighting the system that is anti-humanity. Uh, I'm glad we we left that one last because if you can't do any of the things we talked about prior to uh, developing yourself, uh, combating your own inner contradictions, creating a space to where you and fellow cadre members again, this could be two people, three people, four people, whatever developing a process for y'all to hold each other accountable and to become new beings, you definitely can't go out into a community. Mm -hmm. You definitely can't go out and work with other organizations. Like y'all have to be on point first. And so again, I think these are things that we've had successes as the things we've succeeded at and things that we failed at. This is coming from, uh, we try to have a balance. We've used the word holistic before uh, throughout this organization. We try to have a holistic approach throughout this uh, podcast. We try to have a holistic approach to the advice, the insight, and analysis that we're giving. We're talking from things that I believe we've been successful at, and things that you know we need to do better at. Uh, but again, you know, from a dialectical standpoint, all things are constantly in motion, and so um, even the things that we. I mean, these have are gotten all, good at know, at one I point, you know, that we, we weren't as good at them. And so and I say all this is a reminder to self, first and foremost, yeah. what, <laughs> you without know, without question. And, uh, I think if this people want to listen to this podcast, I, I just ask you to listen and to think with us. You know what I'm saying? And if something bothered you, ask yourself, why did it bother you? And if the shoe fits, ask you, ask yourself, why is the shoe fit? <laughs> you know, like they just have that critical reflection. Yeah, so I would say lastly, uh, to sum it all up again, we said you should uh, identify objectives and define your ideology, uh, put together uh, systems and, and processes to hold yourselves accountable, um, engage in criticism and self-criticism and practice high levels of self-awareness, uh, understanding and engaging political education as a full humanist holistic project. Uh, deal with your inner contradictions, provide and accept space for change, right? Provide as an organization the spaces for which individuals uh, can change and accept the need for change. Uh, don't get caught up in identity politics. Um, those who keep the politics in command are the ones who are best fit to lead. Those are the ones who are best fit to be part of your organization. Nothing else matters. 
can they keep the revolutionary politics in command? Can they follow the principles? Can they adhere to the guidelines? Can they uh, keep the morals and values and the ethos of y'all's organizations, of your ideology, first and foremost in all their actions? Those are the people who should be a part of your organization. Those are the people who are uh, in the best position to lead. And lastly, work to build coalition, but you can't work with other people until you get your own house in order. And yeah, I hope you have found this useful because I have for my own self. Like Abbas said, this is a, a reminder to self. And as we hit year seven, as Kwame Ture says, there ain't nothing but a drop in the bucket. But I am uh, excited for what's to come because, man. Hey, it's significant, bro. We started this what, 24, 25 years old. You know what I'm saying? So to be. You know, trying to follow a tradition and to live up to something that people have given us, uh, you know, to live up to the uh, purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for us, you know, uh, when we could have gone other ways, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's uh, important what we is building and just realizing exactly where we are and being real, you know what I'm saying? I think that's very important is just not to get, just to be real and be uh, truthful about where we are. You know, in that truth that allows us uh, to develop the tools that is necessary to be able to have the proper analysis uh, to move forward in a way that is actually uh, building independence, that is actually uh, building revolution, if this is what we're uh, claiming to try and build, you know. Yeah. And it makes me think of the need to be future focused, like you mentioned earlier. So I would say that's another point we need to add that we spoke to is like the need to be future focused, uh, because I think that's another way to address your individualism is to think about, like, what are we actually leaving the next set of people? Right. Uh, and that makes me think about yeah, like us being in year seven and me never really. I think because of lack of political education and lack of understanding how organizations are developed. Um, I never really thought about seven years from now when we were in my auntie's kitchen making breakfast and at the grocery store at Dollar Tree. I never thought about like what is this gonna look like seven years from now where we have like a whole assembly line for making hygiene packs. So it's not just in my auntie's living room. What did say, man? Judge me by my progress. You know, like I never, I never thought about the future. Um, and at times, I think that was very helpful, it allowed me to be immersed in the present. But I think uh, it's important that we be future focused, especially now as organizations, to think about like, yo, what are our goals to actually leave? you know, this next generation of organizers, because shit, we in our 30s, and I don't, by any means is that, uh, by no means is that old, but like, at some point, you know, we have to make space for newer, for the next generation to come in who's understanding this thing a little bit differently than we are based off, you know, their proximity and age to the streets and to what's happening, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think about the need to just be future focused uh, and this is this podcast has grounded me in the future of, OK, how do we continue to build space? How do we continue to hold ourselves accountable? Uh, I even think about as we get into year seven, I think about when we were looking for a space and, you know, we had somebody with us and we was like, oh, this is cool. He was like, yeah, but y'all going to grow, you know, like <laughs> you feel me? He's like not even realizing like, damn, we only had five or six members at that time. And now we, you know, shit, five, six, seven times more than that. You know, uh, so now I'm even as an organizer thinking about, okay, how do we build this thing now to have double, triple the amount of numbers we have in the next members, two, members. Three, you know, so a thousand volunteers versus 500. You yeah. Know? I just encourage y'all to be future focused, but the future don't matter if we can't work hard in our present moment. You Straight know, up. it's just, it's just kind of irrelevant. That's where you get into what you saying earlier about like idealism, you know, if like your future is focused if you future focus on the future that you ain't even trying to materialize in present day you can't be talking about building an organization with with 200 members when like the three of y'all four of y'all in the present day ain't even abide by the principles ain't even putting that work in and so yeah hey, uh, i hope you all found this uh this uh podcast useful i have optimism and was in life in general you know you have so many people who are so pessim pessimistic about uh freedom in our lifetime or freedom in general like you know people think that the world is gonna blow up before uh new africans can have a nation but you know that's that's they own backwardness man some people just have no spirit no faith and i'm not one of them so free to land Alhamdulillah. <laughs> episode 156 
Hella Black, go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash Hella Black Pod. I think we gave you all a great episode, you know, uh, two months of marination. <laughs> Made it happen. Go to our Patreon, support the real. Free Look at Free the People Press, too, man, because it ain't like we just not doing kind of political education work. Look at Free the People Press. We, we got some dope podcast, stuff, you, you know, know but... we got some dope stuff on the way. So, <laughs> inshallah, keep your eyes out. Make your ears open. Your head on a swivel.